Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where 21st century educators come to share, learn, and be inspired. We believe in the growth mindset, creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration, and strategic uses of education technology. Our mission is to share news and views from teachers who are crushing it in the classroom and making a difference for learners everywhere. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's jump into today's episode. Today I'm speaking with David McFarland. David is a high school IB humanities teacher at Pacific Academy in Surrey, BC, Canada. David, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Are you ready to talk education? Deep in summer, I'm ready to go, yes. (laughs) Sounds good. Why don't you start us off by telling us about your current teaching situation? Yeah, so I teach at Pacific Academy, which is a K-12 uh, independent school. It's a Christian school in Surrey, which is a big, big suburb of Vancouver. And I'm in the high school. So I teach uh, mostly grade 11 and grade 12, a senior high. But uh, my teaching assignment covers grade 9 through 12, which I love sort of seeing that seeing that spread. Awesome. So David, we're going to start out with a low moment in your career. And this is always uh, provides some interesting insights, I think, into sort of where you're coming from. So tell us about a low moment that you faced and then how you worked through that. So very early on, uh, when I came to Pacific Academy, or we call it PA, uh, I'd moved cross country, I trained in uh, Ontario, so a different system. And I was in public schools and then coming to uh, independent and to a Christian school, I was just really needed to learn the culture of a school. I think that happens anywhere. You just, you know, you land somewhere new and, um, right. and what, what's the culture like? So I had the, yeah, and, and this was, you know, my second teaching assignment, a relatively new teacher. And I remember showing up at Pacific Academy and, and I'd spent sort of the summer transferring all all of my thinking over and thinking okay I gotta gotta match up the the lingo and learn all the terminology here in BC and then I just launched in my first class I was teaching was a a grade nine English class okay and I just I jumped in right and I mean I was doing all this all this um, the stuff you're supposed to be doing and all the all the pedagogy and I had my syllabus and and was was doing the thing it was probably the third or fourth day in and I'm just I'm just going to town like and I'm thinking yeah. I'm teaching these amazing lessons yeah. and uh, a student who she's an alum of our school now and and we keep in touch and it's hilarious we, we laugh about this every time is uh, she just sort of blurted out in the middle of whatever uh, instructions I was giving or, or guiding the class to something and she was kind of exacerbated she just said we we don't even know you. We don't even know who you are. Just like she couldn't <laughs> contain herself, and it sort of stopped me, uh, just just in my tracks. And this this phrase, "We don't even know you," and uh, it took me a little while to process that to realize the re- I mean the relational component of teaching. Mm-hmm. I knew I knew about that, like in theory, but I realized and it caught me in that moment. That was um, I mean it's a teachable moment for myself. I learned from that, but. Um, it was kind of kind of low to realize that I was uh, I was plowing ahead without the without the relational uh, component. Hmm. I love that story, David, and thanks for sharing it. I think that's probably the first time I've come across that particular experience. Let's say along along my podcast journey here. So l- let's dig into that just a little bit further. I mean, I think every teacher wrestles with that on some level. What are your thoughts on? you know, how much do we share with our students? We do have to build that relationship. We need to be a little bit transparent about who we are. We have to be human, right? So what are your thoughts on where that line appears? Yeah, that, uh, the idea of the line of, of being, being open, being transparent, but, uh, it's also context specific. I mean, certainly age appropriate. Um, yeah, we've had, we've had a number of conversations, uh, I have with, uh, with some of my colleagues, um, just about that balance of, I mean, err on the side of being being personable and 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 relatable, and uh, but also you know I mean protecting your own your own private life and certainly being being appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a it, it's kind of a it, it's kind of a give and take. Mm-hmm. I think it happens. Um, over time, sort of, it's just like diving into a, to a new class. I'm thinking about. Um, I know some of the students I'm going to be 
uh, meeting a month from now. And I know of them. I, I, I know a little bit. I've met some of them. Uh, but it's something that's going to be organic and it's going to, it's going to gel a little bit. Uh, I can think of just one example when I was in the middle of, um, so IB history, uh, which is, you know, sort of this academic and I'm doing kind of, uh, I was doing a bit of a university lecture style, which is not what I always do, but was in the middle of this. And I realized what, uh, it, there was this natural segue for me to sort of, um, to break from sort of the, the technical stuff I was talking about, the historical mm -hmm. thinking, and give a personal anecdote about what, what we were right. talking about. And it, that was not, I wasn't in my yeah. notes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was, um, that was, that was something that, uh, and it was probably about six weeks into the course. And, and it was after a bit of time of, of developing relationship with the students and students start to know who I am. And that was a very natural thing. I'm not saying, you know, we get it perfect every time, but you're aiming for that pitch, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. David, what is it that excites you about education today? This might be a big picture kind of idea, like our new curriculum here in British Columbia, or it might be a micro level answer, something happening right there at the classroom level. This might sound a little cliche or cheesy to, to say. The, <laughs> sure. the, new the new curriculum, um, I am excited. On the whole, I tilt towards being excited about it. Yeah. And uh, I know there's lots of challenges, and I. Uh, we'll probably talk a little later about some of the voices I'm listening to in, uh, in this conversation. Uh, but I do, I do err on the side of being being for it. The, the possibilities of um, customizing the courses to a, to a certain extent, uh, we've yeah. we've played around a lot with that in, in social studies in particular. Um, yeah, it's cliche to talk about teaching students how to think critically, um, navigating knowledge rather than just you know dumping content on mm -hmm. them. Um, but I think the part for me that um, that excites me about it is um, navigating a world with students uh, that is now entirely digital mm. in, in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and why that excites me is that even at 34, I am, I feel like I'm becoming a bit of a dinosaur <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. In the sense that I remember a, you know, a, I was in that transition generation from, sort of analog to digital. Right. And I sort of had my foot in, in, in both worlds. And for these students, the internet is like electricity. It's always been there and you just flip and it's mm -hmm. on. Um, and I think navigating that with the, and, and the, the curriculum shift uh, towards thinking critically and, and things like media literacy, that type of thing, really, really excite me. Uh, and yet when I mentioned feeling a little bit like a dinosaur, I become an advocate for paper books, right? And, and paper, uh, reading things on paper. Mm. Um, I read, I, I always read this one thing with, with students and, and I try and do this hybrid because everything's digital mm. and then we'll go to a, um, to a text that's mm. on paper. And I, I remember there was a, an article I read, I cannot quite recall who, who said it. I'm, this is not my, my phrase, but talk about students. Um, in order for us to have fully living minds, um, we do need some dead trees <laughs> and uh, talking about the dead tree edition. So I try and, and have a little bit of this, this hybrid, but that's all within, uh, within some of the new directions that I know education is going in BC. And uh, I think the customizing part of it is what, what excites me so much, you know, those, those, those big ideas. Um, but then what does that look like? Sort of the contours of that on the ground in, in a specific context. Mm. I like the dead trees quote, David, and it makes me think, yeah, on the one hand, we've seen the studies and the articles coming out that tell us that sometimes information or content is absorbed more deeply when students or readers in general have a chance to sort of handle something in a tactile way. I'm sure you've seen some of those, those articles as well. But and then on the personal side, I've actually finally made the transition over the Kindle. And I'll ask you in a second if you're, if you're it sounds like maybe you're still a holdout. <laughs> but you know what it did, it, what did it for me was, uh, well, number one, just the portability when I'm traveling, just to have all my books in this yeah. one, you know, low blue light or no blue light kind of a, a surface. And then the other thing is that I'm a highlighter and I, I love to pick out those, those key thoughts. And when I discovered that my Kindle will allow me to do that and save all the highlights in the cloud, I was finally sold. But 
Yeah, I still love I still love the physical book. So where are you personally, David? Can I ask where you're where you're at with that? Yeah, I I'm a bit of a hybrid. I for my long reads, uh, I'm mm. almost exclusively paper. I'm still sure. old school with the with the physical book. Yeah. And uh, I think there'll always be a place for that. Um, but I consume, I do consume a lot of content online. I don't have a Kindle, but uh, through uh, either either a right. phone or, or on a on a screen. I mean, things that are current and, and um, articles. I mean, just reading those mm-hmm. constantly and having mm-hmm. sort of the current element of that. Um, I know one of the things that that I've done with students, and this is the thing when you have a big academic course like history. Yeah. You want to read alongside your students. And uh, so a lot of the stuff that I would, uh, I don't print out everything uh, for students, but I make it all available, um, mm-hmm. you know, PDF and do it all online. And uh, I just see, I'd see students, some of them print, mm-hmm. some of them have it on their on their screen um, in front of them in the classroom. And so I'll do that too. Like I'll, I'll be reading or pull st- stuff mm-hmm. up on screen. So um, I try and balance it. Um, but this summer has been, I mean, I've, uh, with the exception of, you know, the Twitter feed, um, my, my reading happens on paper. All right. Fair enough. Nothing, nothing quite beats a paperback at the beach, right? So there you go, <laughs> David, we call ourselves lifelong learners. We're constantly curious and, and continue to learn personally. Hopefully that's, that's the mark of, of a good educator. So tell us about another area of passion and learning for you outside of the classroom. What are you into and what fuels your fire? So this summer we've, uh, we kind of swap roles a bit. Uh, both my wife and I uh, work through the year, but of course having a bit of time off, um, I switch over and uh, do a lot more uh, cooking than I normally do. And it's not just drudgery, but I do enjoy um, learning some new recipes and, and things like that. So connecting back to technology, um, I've been uh, burning through the New York Times uh, cooking app a little bit okay. and yeah, playing around with that. So I think but having the time to do that rather than sort of this, not not the, the 30 minute uh uh, midweek panic for what we're going to eat, but <laughs> yeah. uh, but pl- playing around right with different cuisines and different uh, uh, different flavors, that kind of stuff. So I, I know my family appreciates uh, that as a habit yeah. <laughs> or as a as a hobby, sorry, you know, as opposed to uh, to something else. There's always a product at the end here yeah. that we can uh, we can eat. So things like uh, grilling, been uh, you know smoking a few things and uh, meats and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So lots of fun when you have the afternoon to, to play around with that. Well, very cool. I, I hat off to you and, and much respect. I, I'm not quite there myself, but I know I need to move a little further in that direction. So yeah. I'll come to you for advice, David, if I need any. Next, David, share about a personal habit that contributes to your success. As teachers and professionals, we have our, our little systems and routines. What's something that you do on the daily that, that really helps, let's say, make you tick? Mm. Okay, a couple quick things. One, uh, good coffee. I grind beans at home. Uh, I grind uh, with colleagues. We grind beans at school. So there's the ritual component. I mean, okay. I could go on about yeah. I could go on about good coffee, but I think there's the relational component. Um, I'll take the extra time um, to make a good cup of coffee, and and it really that's the the social bond with whether it's talking with my wife in the morning or talking with colleagues before we head off to the classroom, that type of thing. So having a relate, uh, having a, a ritual that is that is uh, relational. The other thing I do, connected back to reading, is uh, I try and take probably well, it wouldn't be a whole a, a whole prep block in a day, uh, one of them a week, but I'll try and uh, schedule in a time. This is during the academic year, where I'm I'm reading something that is beyond the beyond the bounds of say my course or um what what i need to be reading for my students or reading student work or for the marking or whatever is actually having a few different um books that kind of thing on the go sometimes we try to have a a, a book club or book study or whatever but i do it on my own i would and i'll do i'll build that into my week and actually do it at my desk or have it at the have it at the school and I, it's part of my own professional growth is to stay, it's not just about staying current, but it's staying sort of tuned in, 
you know, to, uh, to what's going on. So that's, that's a habit that I, I try, I don't apologize for. I've had, I've had a couple, you know, colleagues walk in, I'm just kind of sitting there reading a book. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but um, I have found that to be, I mean, it's a, it's a habit that is you know, life giving, you know? Mm hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm such a big believer. And, and, you know, I haven't gotten around to ever doing that. I have seen other teachers do that. And, and I think there's a part of me that just needs to sort of settle down and let, you know, just put aside some of that, like you said, the, the never ending mountain of marking or, or whatever right. it might right. be and, and just say, yeah, I'm going to fuel this, this other passion. And, and definitely as a lit teacher, that's, I think, a mm -hmm. very important modeling practice as well that, that our students need to know that that we're plugged into, you know, other types of pleasure reading. David, we're moving into some rapid fire recommendations. I know you, you are active on Twitter, so look forward to, to this next question, but tell us about someone that we need to add to our PLN on Twitter. So if it were one, one person to add, um, I highly advocate uh, Glenn Thielman is a, um, he's a social studies teacher uh, out of Prince George. Um, and he is like hyperactive online and blogging and, uh, you know, offering a lot of his course material, but it, it re he reflects on practice beyond just if you're a social studies teacher. Um, it, it's fascinating to see what he's doing in a, in a very particular local context. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's, um, he's a guy I, I highly recommend. He's a huge, huge advocate of the shift over to the new curriculum as well. Very cool. All right. And, and just before we continue, I'll make sure to get all of these links and, and Twitter handles and whatnot onto the show notes there at teachersonfire.net. So if you are listening and you want to plug these people in and follow along with David's recommendations, you can look, look them all up there at teachersonfire.net. Next, David, point us to an ed tech tool that you currently love using in your classroom or your day-to-day -day work. Might sound kind of basic, but the Google Classroom tool that uh, we use, well, I use it daily. Right. Um, we kind of Google fied our school a couple of years ago and you know, you got early adopters, you got this and that, the other thing. Uh, I started using it every day as just to augment what's going on in my classroom. And mm -hmm. I post every day. Um, I've gotten into the habit of it only takes, you know, 15 minutes of my time mm -hmm. every day, every link, every article, every, everything. Uh, mm -hmm. on there, I have found it to be as a tool to bring efficiency to my day of navigating students who are the, and it's very common in high school context. You've got students away for legitimate reasons, illegitimate reasons, whatever they're absent, go to the news feed, right? The timeline of my classroom. And then when it comes to, um, sort of those summative moments of it's time to, uh, time for students to go back, they have the same timeline and they can scroll back through. Mm -hmm. Um, so you create this, this log I've, I've done that for a couple of years now. Um, the biggest feedback I've, I've gotten as well is not just from parents, but actually our, uh, learning support staff. They're, they're on there too, and they, they absolutely love it um, because it's anybody who needs to be tuned into, you know, beyond the, the four walls of my classroom, they get that, they have that portal into it. So use it all the time, every day. Well, I love that pitch, and I understand what you mean by, you know, the basic tool, but man, Google Classroom is a fantastic LMS, and I know there are others that are, that are good as well, but the other day I was asked about my communication with parents and I thought back over the last year and at first I thought, I'm not sure I did such a great job. And then I, I remembered that, you know, I'm logging just like you, I'm logging absolutely every move on Google Classroom and parents get these daily summaries of what's happening in our classes. And I thought, oh, you know what, actually... My parents, I think, got a very clear sense of what was going on in my classes. So if they want to be tuned in, it's there, right? If you provide it. 100%. Yeah. And then and then you're right with the SEAs and, and our support team in our classes, working with uh, students who have a special needs designation or what have you. I think uh, that's a tremendous resource for them. Now, quick question on that, David. Do you add your... Uh, your SEAs as, do you invite them as a teacher or do you invite them as a student? Originally they were, they would get the classroom code or whatever, and then they'd sign up. 
but then they become a student, uh, which uh, w- was a bit problematic. So uh, I tend to, we now have, yeah, it's like multiple teachers on a course. Um, and so whether you're, whether you're with our, yeah, EAs or um, even, even um, team teaching, right? Like I have, I was uh, out of the classroom for a number of days uh, in June, uh, but uh, when I had a, a colleague was, was covering for me, just um, added her as, as the teacher. And then she was getting caught up on what was going on. So yeah, absolutely. I, the more the merrier with the teachers. Now that does give, um, you can't get super granular with, uh, with Google and, and sort of have administrative and, and your marks and that kind of stuff. So you gotta be careful there, but. Yeah. I found, you know, if you add a, a an assistant or a support uh, we call them special education assistants. If, if you add them as students, then it, it looks like you always have one or two assignments that have not been submitted and, and you sort of have that problem happening. So I, I'm just curious to hear how other teachers are managing that. So it sounds like your solution is pretty close to mine. We're moving into books, David. Now you're an English lit teacher. You must have a long list of favorites, but is there one maybe that you've been reading lately this summer or maybe an all-time fave that you'd like to recommend for us? Yeah, this was tricky to pick just one book. Um, one that came out a couple of years ago that I've used just across uh, so my, my different courses that I teach is uh, it's not exactly an, an education book, but in a way it is. Um, James K.A. Smith, philosopher, educator, wrote a book called You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. And he goes uh, he goes into sort of a bit of an anthropology of who, who we are as humans. And we're, his, his assertion is, it's actually an ancient assertion uh, from the likes of, of guys like uh, Augustine, who would say we're not primarily um, thinking or cognitive beings, so not primarily as we are affective, or to use mm-hmm. an English word, um, we're lovers. Uh, what do we What do we love? And we're drawn to some orientation of uh, of the good and what we love. And we're formed. We're actually as humans and as as uh, people, we are shaped by objects of our affection and so that that doesn't have to that doesn't have to be uh you know a, a deity or something like that but in, in a sense it's what what is it that is our passion and drives us and so he, he goes into that in, in a lot of ways and actually he, he so he uses a, a religious word liturgy which you know uh, like practices and he, he he actually speaks of um he would call them secular liturgies so every culture every place has this set of practices that actually shapes who we are and sometimes it's done um, consciously oftentimes these are unconscious things that are happening to us um, and so uh, it's it's an accessible um, but it's sort of user-friendly like it's not um, some of the stuff I read uh, with 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 James Smith can be um, very very academic this this volume is like accessible in the sense of I get what he's saying and I can see the application, especially in education. So I talk about that with students, um, get them to think about that in whether it's a social studies class, whether it's, you know, in my, my academic history class, uh, what have you. So I've used I've even used sort of the intro from that with uh, with students. Yeah, I really appreciate Jamie Smith as well. And you're right, he can certainly wax esoteric and cerebral if he wants to. He has that capacity, but uh, yeah, he's got a lot of really practical insights as well. This one feels grounded, yeah. David, are you a podcast listener? And if you are, tell us about a podcast that you're enjoying and one that we should add to our podcast deck. So I'm skewing a little bit towards history here, but uh, there's a, a whole bunch of conversations. There's a, a historian um, down at university in the U.S. called uh, named John Thea, F-E-A, okay. uh, and he has this podcast called um, The Way of Improvement Leads Home, which is a weird title, uh, but it comes from sort of the revival era in, uh, in the United States. He writes and then podcasts um, about history, historical thinking, um, the role of religion in society, which is a hot button topic, certainly in his context um, in the U.S. Um, talks a little bit about baseball and also it's sort of a, a mixed bag of, of things. 
um, but it is um, he's doing it as an educator. He's doing it. He's a, a professor of history, um, but the college that he's at, um, their history department seems to be really linked with their education program. And so some of the insights that that he's bringing to, I mean, what I do in social studies and in history is historical thinking. And that's completely embedded in our new BC curriculum. John Fia would have no, you know, no connection to BC curriculum. But I, I whenever I listen to it, it's like, oh, there's there's the overlap all the time. So uh, yeah, it's a it's an interesting uh, little podcast that uh, that they put out. I think there's about four or five seasons now. All right, I look forward to checking that out. Sounds fascinating. Two more questions, David. They both relate to video in some way. I know everyone uses YouTube a little bit differently. Some people subscribe to channels. Other people just sort of type in whatever it is that they're searching for. But tell us if you are a subscriber, is there a channel out there that you really enjoy? And this one it could be one that you use in your classroom practice or maybe one that you just find personally amusing. This one's both, both amusing and I use it in my uh, classroom. John Green's Crash Courses um, and the, the history ones in particular. Uh, but I don't just, uh, I don't just, you know, hit play and, you know, see at the end kind of thing. Yeah. Um, they, they are these massive prompts for, um, I use, you know, sort of a, a hook into a, a topic. Because we can, we can deconstruct them. I think John Green himself would want, uh, you know, the, the type of things he's introducing students to thinking about, or um, sort of the historiography of of perspective taking, etc. So the crash courses are like they're they're rapid fire. Like it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose. He goes so fast. But then I'll usually have students um, uh, have to respond to that in some way, right? And sort of and sort of interact with them. So and I watch them for fun too. Um, they're just uh, they're just hilarious. He's phenomenal. Love that channel. So I'm going to second that vote for Crash Course. And you're right. He presents the stuff, the the information, the ideas in an entertaining way, with a lot of I think astute insights. And he also has some critical questions. So I, I think back to I think he's got a video on the Renaissance, for example. That if I've got this right, he he sort of asked the question: Was there even a Renaissance, or is that something we've kind of fabricated. So he does do a good job of, of, of sort of deconstructing some of the, the narratives in history. Really appreciate his work. And then last question on the list, David, you're at the end of your day, you've got no energy left for reading or marking or anything else productive. What is it that you're watching on Netflix these days? So with the uh, with the summer season, I am working my way back from the beginning through the end of The Office, all the reruns. And uh, true confession, I've not actually seen the end, so don't ruin it for me. Um, and yeah, we're deep in season five right now, and we just we just keep going through it. So you, you scroll through Netflix, it's like, what should I watch? That's what I'm doing. When that's done, though, um, I've got to go back and get primed for the new season of uh, Better Call Saul, which is out. So really excited about that. But uh, we got to deal with Michael and, and Dwight first. <laughs> Well, I, I think that series has gotten the most votes of the educators I've pulled so far. And yeah, I've been through it a few times. And man, is it ever good for a laugh some nights. So on, on those days when you've really got nothing left or you just need a good laugh, it's, it's a great place to go. David, this has been so much fun. For people who are interested in more of your thoughts and more of your content, what are the best ways for them to follow you online? So I'm on uh, Twitter. And that would be the best way to do it. I'm, uh, you'll link it up uh, at Mr. McF Teaches. And that's where I kind of put all my, uh, my thoughts, academic, teaching, theological, what have you. It's all on there. All in one place. All right, David. Well, this has been so much fun. It's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit better. And I just wish you a great month of August. Hope you get fully charged up. Enjoy some great family time and come back in the fall ready to go. Awesome. You as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of Teachers on Fire, where teachers come to share, learn, and be inspired. Please subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review on iTunes, and follow us on Twitter at Teachers on Fire. I'm your host, Tim Cavey, saying goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast.